Cup in May of 2015. He obtained an honors degree in commerce from the University of Saskatchewan and worked in marketing with Maple Leaf Pizza Network. A number of executive positions, including chief of staff to the leader of the opposition. In 1996, he was appointed to the position of manager of public and intergovernmental affairs and special projects for the city of Saskatoon, where his duties included project management for the River Landing Redevelopment Initiative. Chris returned to the government of Saskatchewan in 2009 as senior vice president of marketing and investment attraction for Enterprise Saskatchewan and was appointed Chief Executive Officer in 2010. Before joining STEP, Chris served as the Associate Deputy Minister of the Minister of Economy and Chief Executive Officer of the Global Transportation Hub. He is an accredited public relations practitioner, an APR, and two-time winner of the prestigious Premier's Award for Excellence in the Public Service. Thank you, Chris, for joining us today. And Chris, we'll get you to turn your mic back on and join and get your webinar started. Well, thank you very much uh, for that introduction. It's a, a great pleasure to join with the Women Entrepreneurs of Saskatchewan on this webinar, on a topic that really is um, something that is of great interest, not only to me, to, but to many people in Saskatchewan, that business, exports, and, and trade. Um, I should note that while I've participated in, in webinars before, this is my first time presenting, so be gentle with me. I was uh, reminded of my limited technical expertise when we uh, tried to get the camera working on my end to no avail. Uh, but that's okay. For those of you who have met me, uh, you're not missing much by <laughs> missing my, my, my end of the camera. Uh, so we're going to go through uh, a lot of material today with, with some speed because I do want to get to some, some questions and, and discussion. Uh, but we are going to talk about... Um, an overview of, of, of Saskatchewan's exports, uh, the Saskatchewan export story. Uh, we're going to talk to you about the importance of exports to you and your business, what you need to know in terms of export readiness, what questions you should be asking to assess whether you're ready or not. And then we'll talk about what assistance is available to you as you consider taking the first step or perhaps the next step onto the national and international stage. So the Saskatchewan export story is really quite interesting and it's important, it's critical for all of us to understand. And that is that we have in Saskatchewan a very small domestic market. 1.1 million sounds like a lot of people, but it's tiny in comparison to the markets that surround us. So we have to export. We must sell our goods and services outside of our borders in order to grow and to succeed economically. And we do it very well. As you can see by this chart, over the last five years or so, or so we've been anywhere from 26 to $35 billion of exports out of Saskatchewan. We peaked in 2014, as you can see, at 35.4. And we've dropped the last two years. Uh, I'll show you why that is when I show you what we export out of Saskatchewan. But by comparison with our neighbors, Ontario, Alberta, Quebec, and BC, with very large populations, even at $26.5 billion, we punch up our weight in terms of exports. In fact, we are the number one province in the country in terms of exports per capita by a long shot. And again, it's because of the large amounts of, of resources and commodities that we produce and the small population. So what is it that we send around the world? Well, it's not shouldn't be much of a surprise to most of you. But if you go through each of these, you'll see that it's oil and potash, number one, wheat, canola seed, lentils, peas, uranium, and canola oil. I'll just uh, uh, focus your attention on the first and last of these two products. First, there's oil. The substantive amount of oil that we produce goes into the United States almost exclusively. And that's why you see it dropped, actually, over the 10 years. It's actually dropped over the last two years. And that's almost exclusively because of the price of a barrel of oil. The volumes that we produce and ship out remain relatively steady, but it is the price that has made, meant that the top export has declined over the last two years and by 24% over 10 years. The others have increased substantially, as you can see by this chart. But all of those, the first seven are all commodities or resources, right? It's oil, potash, wheat, canola seed. The last one is canola oil. 
And that's what we call a value added product. So instead of shipping canola seed out, which you'll see right above that, we're actually processing our commodities into canola oil and then shipping it out. That's the great way to add value to your exports and to your total exports and to the economy. It's the value added economy that we're really trying to push. And we're delighted to see that that has grown over the last 10 years, as you can see, by 5,461%. This is a substantive amount. So where does it go to? Well, it goes largely to the United States, and that shouldn't be a surprise. About 50% of what we export goes to the United States for obvious reasons. It's right next door. They speak the same language, American, uh, same business culture, uh, and it's a large market, which I'll show you in a moment. China is followed up by, at 3.2 billion, India at 1.45, Japan, Mexico, Brazil, Pakistan, Indonesia, UAE, United Arab Emirates, and Turkey. In fact, we ship to over 150 countries around the world, but these are our top 10. I just want to show you by comparison, the fastest growing market being China has increased uh, by about 350% over 10 years, 2005 to 2015. It's a big market that we are seeing a lot of success because it is growing and it's growing substantially. We spend a lot of effort in marketing our products into China, but we shouldn't do that at the expense of our existing customers, and that is the United States. It's a huge market, and this certainly tells that story. This is a map of the United States with each of the states compared to a country of the world that has a similar GDP. And you'll see that the, for instance, the state of California has the same GDP of the entire United Kingdom. Texas, Saudi Arabia, uh, New York, it's the size of Turkey. The point here is that we have a massive market right next door. We don't have to go necessarily around the world or overseas uh, and into some of the exotic markets or developing markets in order to experience growth. Uh, it's right next door in the United States of America. So if you're joining us on this webinar, you may have already asked the question. If you're looking to export, is it worth all of the effort? Why would you look to do this? Well, exporting can be one of the best ways to grow your business. We found that it's about increased profitability. You can grow your bottom line. We find that companies that export are 17% more profitable than those that don't. And on average, companies that export, uh, they grow faster, they create more jobs, and even the employees can earn 10% more when compared to non-exporting companies. You'll also find diversification is one of the benefits. And by diversification, we're talking about not keeping all of your eggs in one basket. You get to spread your risk and reward across several markets. So for instance, if you're selling into Saskatchewan and Alberta, and you found an export market in California, uh, if our domestic market goes down, you, have, you may have a growing market in California in which to serve. It's also about diversification across your, your business cycles. What I mean by that is that it could smooth out your seasonal differences. And a very good and simple example of that is if you're developing, manufacturing, and exporting snow shovels, you might have a great domestic market, but if the winter didn't you know, turn out so great, or for instance, we go into summer, you have another market Again, for instance, in Chile or perhaps uh, a little further south where you can ship your goods into and they're experiencing the winter on our off season. So there's a bit of seasonal diversification involved in, in exporting as well. Of course, there's economies of scale. The bigger you get, the more uh, production you get, the, the cheaper the goods that you buy in because of the economies of scale. Um, we find that exporting companies in Canada average about a 14% higher productivity you get to use your production capabilities to the fullest extent. And you get a, an added benefit of, an, of enhanced innovation. And by that we mean, um, you know, different markets will have different demands and business practices, and it'll help keep your company at the forefront of your, of your industry. Uh, it'll increase your competitiveness and increase the value of your intellectual property should you decide to license it, and indeed increase the value of your business should you choose to sell it, and of course, hopefully start up another. 
I should mention that there are other uh, benefits to exporting that accrue to consumers. They get more variety, typically lower prices, and typically higher qualities. And for the countries that experience the exporting, they get increased foreign direct investment, higher employment rates, there's revenue generation, and they get to enhance their, their global relations. But of course, with all of the benefits of exporting, there are challenges. Talking about different cultures here, typically, even in the United States, you will find different business cultures um, and in other areas of the world, business practices, language barriers, there's ethics and consumer demands. Uh, some of the examples that, that uh, factor in and may differ from one market to another. There's financial risk here, substantial financial risk in some cases. Uh, exporting firms can range uh, from, in terms of the challenges from currency fluctuations to uh, collection challenges when you're dealing with customers from around the world. Logistics, well, logistics are about how you're gonna get your product or service to your clients in different markets. And shipping from one country to another requires a lot of planning and can present challenges, especially for first time exporters. And then there's protectionism. Much of you, uh, most of you will, will know what that is, having uh, picked up a newspaper in the last couple of weeks and a couple of months as it relates to NAFTA. Uh, protectionisms uh, are implemented through the use of tariffs, sometimes in non-tariffs and legal barriers such as duties and imports and quotas and product bans. And I just wanted to chat about that just very quickly before we get into the next phase. You deal with those kinds of issues through what are called FTAs, free trade agreements. And the three biggest that we've been working on of late, uh, the first one which has the European flag in Canada is CETA, the Comprehensive uh, Agreement on Trade between Europe and Canada, which was provisionally uh, put into place just this past month. This is a big market for us. EU, we trade about $1.3 billion worth of goods from Saskatchewan into that market. But there are some products and areas and services and manufactured goods where we face some significant tariffs. Those all have dropped as a result of that free trade agreement, and we get uh, preferred country status now into Europe, and we find it will be a great opportunity for Saskatchewan companies to increase their exports into Europe. I'm going to skip NAFTA for a second and go to TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which you have heard, and I had thought was dead in the water after uh, Mr. Trump, President Trump, decided that they would not participate. All the other companies and countries in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, including uh, places like Australia and Japan, all wanted access into the United States. When the United States pulled out, we thought TPP was dead, but the remaining countries are all going to now look to see if they can't get a free trade agreement amongst themselves. Good news for us is that then we would get uh, favored nation status into Japan, which is another huge market for us if that goes, to, uh, goes, goes uh, into fruition. Then, of course, you've all heard about NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, which is being renegotiated now. We've had unfettered access in the United States for just about 20 years now uh, and have taken full advantage of it, as you saw from a previous slide. Uh, we're hoping that there will be a successful renegotiation of, of NAFTA and that there will be no new tariffs. We hold out hope, even though uh, it will be challenging. And we've got a, a president who um, certainly uh, focuses on protectionism and, and United States first. Uh, that will be key for us. The next round of negotiations happens, I, I believe, in Washington, and uh, there will be no hope for a, a, a renegotiated NAFTA by the end of the year. They've extended into the, into 2018, so we'll keep our, our eye on that one. So let's get a little bit more focused on, on uh, what you may want to think about if you're going to take that first step or next step into exporting. And let's talk about export readiness. And export readiness to us is really about Assessing your, ready, your, ready, your readiness, then selecting your market, then executing the plan. So really it's ready, aim, fire. What I want to talk to you about, because each one of those areas could take a full day of seminars to go through about what we mean and what you might want to know uh, about those elements of the plan, I want to talk to you about the ready part, export readiness. These are a series of questions that I'm going to go through with you that you need to kind of ask yourself, your company, about um, various aspects of exporting and various places in readiness in your business that you need to think about before you take that next step. 
These questions are fairly familiar. If you've been around the uh, websites that uh, do some expert readiness, they're very common to each site. And some of the sites, and I'll give you some of those URLs at the end, actually have an opportunity for you to answer these questions. And then they will give you a score as to whether or not you are ready or not. But it's, it's, it's useful just to go through them and, and explain what they're after. Do you have a fully developed product or service in your domestic company? It sounds like a fairly simple and easy question to answer. But a lot of people do chicken and egg and egg and chicken. They may not want to develop a product before they know whether they've got a market for it. And that market may be international. So it's not as easy as you think. So we first ask, when we ask for membership at a step, do you have a product uh, that is ready that you have in your domestic market? And are you ready to, to then um, make that next step? Is your management committed to the effort and cost of adding to that domestic product or foreign uh, or service to a foreign market? It's an important question. It's about um, adjusting for market trends. Uh, you've got to take a look at specific packaging requirements. Are there health and safety standards, et cetera, in terms of bringing that into a foreign market? Does your organization have a competitive selling proposition for your product or service? This is about your value proposition. You may have developed one for your domestic market, but is it similar to your export market or do you have to change it or don't develop it? Do you have sufficient production capacity that can be committed for export? I'm gonna stop here for a second because this is very, very important. Some of you may have recall a, an ad from FedEx back in the 1990s that involved an online startup company. They were clearly going to do all of their orders over online and they just clicked the button to start taking orders online and the staff gather around the screen and they see that first order pop up and there's great celebration and, and screaming and then 10 come up and they're just, the, the, the celebration continues until it gets into the thousand, then all of a sudden 5,000, 20, 150, 200,000 orders. And you can just see the balloon go out of these people's faces because they realize there's no way they're going to be able to fulfill those orders. What we're talking about here is very similar to the SMEs that we talk to that may want to go into, for instance, China. They may have great markets here for, for honey, but if you go into the Chinese market, are you going to be able to produce enough honey to supply what the orders you may be in some of these very, very large markets? It's an important question to ask. Do you have the management knowledge and experience and commitment required to develop export markets? This is about resources and capacity, not only as an owner, but your, your management team as well. So for those that are watching carefully, you will see that that next question is actually doubled. It's just me not paying attention and submitting a, uh, a slide deck that contained a, uh, a doubled question. So have you conducted some research? Primary, which is your own first-hand investigations, and secondary, which is analyzing the research of others for the target that you have selected. Uh, again, you have to start thinking about questions like, does the product need to be adapted, and how? How is your pricing affected by the market? Uh, what's your pricing strategy? Uh, what would be the most effective way to do that? What are the main, who are the main buyers? What are the delivery distribution logics? What are the channels in your project service typically promoted? So you have to start looking at some significant research uh, before you're ready. So how are you going to distribute that product in market? Is it going to be retail? Are you going to wholesale it? Are you going to go through a distributor? Do it online? Have you made contacts with those buyers? Are you aware of tariffs? So when we're talking about protectionism, uh, are there import regulations and standards and packaging labeling required applied to your product or to your industry? You have your promotional material ready. If you're going into a market that has a different language, have you prepared and budgeted for translation? Have you reached out to the various shipping distribution channels and find, figured out the, channel, uh, the distribution channels and their costs? And you better get very familiar with what's called an INCO term. INCO terms are rules uh, for defining the obligations of the delivery of the merchandise. It's, it's short, short for international commercial terms and they outline who pays for what costs and where the risks uh, shift from buyer to seller. And are you protected against risks such as non-delivery and non-payment at every stage? It's one thing to not being paid by a business across the street it's a very different thing from not being paid from somebody from India or Indonesia, for instance. So 
all of those questions are what you need to start thinking about if you really and are seriously thinking about getting into the export business. Now, it may sound a little bit daunting, it may sound um, concerning, but there is a lot of resources out there that are available to you that will help you through that and provide some of the answers that you may be, may be looking for. Let me go through just a few of them before we get to what we can offer at STEP. BDC on the bottom left corner, that's the Business Development Bank. That's Canada's uh, development bank for SMEs, small and medium enterprises. They offer financing. They also offer advisory services, particularly in international engagement and capital. EDC is Export Development Canada. You recall I talked to you about INCO terms and are you insured? Uh, do you know who you're dealing with? Do you want to make sure that you have insurance when you go out into that real world? That's what they provide. They provide export credit insurance, bonding services, as well as foreign market expertise. A good friend, friends in the federal government from Global Affairs Canada are critical to what you will want to do uh, in international uh, markets. They not only have local staff, including some that are co-located right here in STEPS offices in Saskatoon, but they also have the Trade Commission. They're the ones that have the posts around the world who are dedicated to helping you trade with the country that they are in. One other uh, element of Global Affairs Canada and the Canadian Trade Commissioner Service that you want to be aware of uh, as women is an outfit called Business Women in International Trade, BWIT. Check out their website because they are a part of the federal government, which is the only national program and service that I know of that is, uh, provides targeted products and services to help women entrepreneurs internationalize. Again, that's BWIT, Business Women in International Trade. So I want to talk to you about what we can do at STEP for you and perhaps your first foray or your expansion into international markets. First of all, STEP is an independent agency of government. We are not a ministry. We are not a crown corporation. Uh, we are a unique structure, a public-private partnership, but we're led by the Saskatchewan Export Industry. We have a board of 15. There's 12 elected export members that sit on our board and provide us assistance and direction and, and strategy to move products and help SMEs move their products around the world. So our members are Saskatchewan-based companies pursuing markets. They do have that exportable product or service, uh, and they're small and medium large, uh, typically. We have everybody from Viterra and Cameco, uh, very large multinational corporations, down to uh, really mom and pop shops who have just started and realized that the domestic market here in Saskatchewan is too small and that they can span to uh, other markets and grow their businesses. Our membership includes regular businesses, associates, and premiums. This is that you would probably fit into where we uh, have our regular uh, membership, and that's companies that currently are exporting or are looking to export with a tangible product or service. The premium members are very robust companies that are already in the international field but want to step up and have additional services from STEP, and they pay a premium price for that service. So what we offer for service is a lot of the answers to the questions I asked earlier. We offer export market consultation advice and guidance, specific guidance on trade finance, tra transportation and logistics issues. And once you're ready to take that product or service abroad, we can provide very tangible and certain very tangible services that are dedicated to your needs as a business. So we do outbound business development missions, 40 to 45 a year. That means we take five businesses with us into a particular market and perhaps at a trade show and help them market to uh, buyers, retailers, distributors, and wholesalers. Again, we do 40 to 45 of those a year. We also do incoming buyer missions. These are very efficient ways to bring international buyers in to meet with our members uh, within a particular sector. A couple months ago, we had uh, 30 Asian buyers come into our agri-food sector, and they uh, conducted all sorts of business everywhere from, from honey to uh, camelina oil um, and to chickpeas and, and a number of other agri-food products. We offer qualified trade leads. 
we get a number of companies asking and phoning us saying, where can I procure, for instance, lentils, or where can I get uh, bolts for mining? And we provide those to our members. So it goes straight from received to our members. We did 4,707 of those just this previous year. And then we do customized market intelligence reports. We do 300 of those a year for our members. This is where you come to us and say, look, I've got a widget. I think my market is in the United States, but I'm not sure which state, for instance. Can you help me determine, for instance, what my market might be in Cal uh, sorry, California, who the competition might be, what are the prices, what is the regulatory barriers for shipping my product, product into California? And those kinds of questions are all done in customized market intelligence reports that we do for our members each and every year. We also have a market access program, MAP. So if you become a member of STEP and you want to go to that California market with your widget and you've never been there before, we will reduce that risk. We want to encourage your entry into that market by saying, look, we'll help you with the cost of that particular mission. As long as you haven't been in that market before and it's a, a legitimate marketing, international marketing exercise, we will subsidize your flight or your hotel or perhaps your booth space at any particular trade show. As I mentioned, we have an incoming buyers program. We will also do uh, help you plan your trip. If you've never been to a particular market, uh, never even been abroad, we'll help you plan that trip down to um, you know, a daily and hourly schedule for you. We also provide networking opportunities with like-minded exporters. Uh, we do international promotions for our magazine, Global Ventures, guides and directories. We do a lot of what we're doing right now, and that's educational seminars on export topics. Uh, our members have access to over 20 of these every, every year. I do want to point one out to you that might be of some value to you. We're having one next week, November 1st. Is that next week? November 1st. Uh, it's in Regina, and it's about agricultural products into the United States. And it's very specific about perhaps you have some products you want to get into the United States. How do you find the right partner? Should we be concerned about the NAFTA negotiations? Uh, is there an exporter guide to the United States, which there is? Uh, what are the foods? That, uh, there's a whole bunch of very detailed steps on how to move uh, food products, ingredients products, ag products into the United States. November 1st in the morning in Regina. Uh, go online to um, our website to find out whether or not that's, that's a good fit for you. So as I mentioned, we do 40 to 45 missions around the world every year. We bring in buyers from all over the world into Saskatchewan. And this is to help our exporters. I want to just leave you with, with this thought and get a little bit more specific to uh, women in international business. We have a number of, of, of members who are very successful, including whom you'll all recognize here, Rachel Milkey from Hilberg and Burke. She's been a member for just about 10 years since she start, started in 2007. And as you know, she manufactures and retails beautiful jewelry around the world out of her business uh, location and, and headquarters in Regina. Likewise, Natasha and Alicia Vanderhoek uh, from Three Farmers. Uh, they produce this very unique uh, traceable farm-to-fork products in camelina oil and roasted chickpeas and, and pea pops. And then some of you might know uh, Angela Prop Schmidt uh, from Red Willow Organics. She, she produces certified organic grains, uh, clovers, oil seeds, and beefs, uh, and beef, and, and, and certainly is exporting it outside of our, out of, out of our province. And she established near Carrot River. And she also sits on the board of Saskatchewan's Trade and Export Partnership. Uh, so there's wonderful opportunities, not only for businesses, but for, for women looking to engage internationally. Uh, I would encourage you to check out our website, as I mentioned to you previously, it's sastrade.sk.ca. There's a member directory. You can go in there and see who else is, is a member of STEP, and that's listed by sector. There's some uh, exporter resources that you can take advantage of without having to be a member. Trip reports, finance guides, uh, other business tools. And then there's that calendar of events on our seminars and missions and, and partnered events that you can take full advantage of. Uh, and if you want to contact us outside of, of on, uh, online opportunities, you can always call us, drop us an email. We're on Twitter um, and uh, we're available at any time. 
Uh, that's the quick presentation. Um, I wanted to leave as much time as we can. Well, it's a, just about a half hour for any comments, questions, or, or suggestions you might have. And in talking to um, the staff at uh, WESC, I understand we can do that through chat, um, or they can be uh, read by the uh, uh, host through the speakers and, and through, through, through microphones. So if anybody has any questions or comments, I'd be happy to uh, entertain them. I see Wendy is typing, so wait for that question. And Chelsea's typing. While we're waiting for those questions to come in, I should note that um, Prabha Mitchell and I have been meeting on, a, on numerous occasions on how we might be able to do a, a larger event um, for women in international business and, and exports. Uh, and we're looking at doing something in the, in the new year. So stay tuned um, and make sure you follow both WESC and, and uh, SAS Trade Step for further information on that. We think it's a, it's a, it's a critical topic um, and one that I think benefits uh, STEP, exports, and women alike. There's a great, I should note, there's a great stud, study being having been done out of Australia that notes that 81% of women-owned business export within the first five years. Now, that's extraordinary. Uh, most businesses that are located here in Canada are certainly can't claim that they are exporting within the first five years, let alone being women-owned. So it's a pretty impressive opportunity out of Australia that I think we can match here in Canada. Okay, here's some first questions. Well, there's the question. On average, how fast can I export it to establish a foreign market? It's a, it's a good question. Um, and if you are export ready, if you've done all of your homework, um, there are some technicalities and some bureaucracies and filings that you need to do. Uh, you need to uh, activate your business number for export, which is a really quite easy thing to do. If you have a GST or HST number, to start exporting, you just phone CRA and adjust your business number for this purpose, and that becomes your, your number exporter. Uh, you have to do some research, obviously, as I had mentioned. That doesn't take too terribly long if it's, it's, if it's a simple product in a simple market. Uh, then you have to develop your, your logistics. Uh, literally, if you are prepared and you have the resource and capacity, I would say you could get to an export market within a year providing you've done a lot of your homework uh, ahead of time. So hopefully that answers that question. Chelsea, thank you. Great job in the presentation. Don't have any questions. Will this webinar be recorded provided to the email? Yes. Um, the WESC staff uh, mentioned that it will be recorded. Uh, I don't know how they present it, whether it is on the website and you could just click it, or whether or not it's, it's emailable, but I think that uh, your question to WESC will provide that answer. Are there general procedures in receiving country to go through? Oh, yeah. Um, and they're different in, in, in every country, unfortunately. These free trade agreements I'm talking about tend to cut through a lot of that. What they do is not only say that, look, you can, we can export and import to each other without any tariffs. Everything will be zero. Everything will be held at a neutral tariff. Then they start talking about regulations. Can we harmonize regulations? So that when I send you a widget with a cord on it, that cord is the same under the same safety regulations here as it is in the United States. So if you produce it here and you get regulatory approval here, you're regulatory approved in the country that you're sending it to. So um, general procedures really is mostly about what you're producing and what you're selling and what the safety uh, and other regulations will be. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Wendy. Ah, okay. Uh, yes, our friends at West say that it will be posted under the website under recorded webinars. That's fantastic. Oh, I'm on YouTube. That's cool. Um, hopefully, yeah, Wendy. I hope that answers your question. It's it's a large, um, it's it's a big question. The quick answer is yeah, there are 
and, and folks like STEP and some of the other resources will help you go through those. Does anybody have a specific product that they were thinking about exporting that you might have a specific question on? Or is it very early in your thinking about going internationally? I can understand that. That um, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, that same study that Australia did, um, we would really like to replicate it here because there's some interesting data there. The women that own businesses that are exporting, 33% reported over 50% of the revenue is coming from exporting, um, and 74% are looking to expand, and none of them indicated that they were looking at scaling back their, their global reach. So obviously, um, women in international engagement in Australia is doing exceptionally well and we may want to take a look to see if we can't replicate uh, their programs and services here. Canola seed, yeah, um, absolutely. Canola, uh, the big issue with canola seed around the world, not so much into the United States, but into Europe and China is about the GMO uh, stance on, on canola seed. Uh, you know, I believe the science, right? I mean, everybody should be science-based and know that the, that uh, GMO canola um, is is completely safe, has been proven completely safe. But some countries um, want to put up uh, barriers to to um, selling and importing canola based on their fear of GMOs, and that's where these science-based regulatory bodies and free trade agreements come very, very handy. Um, they will say, no, we are going to judge an import based on science. So we're going to allow, for instance, canola seed to come in, Canadian and American canola seed to come into Europe and into China, for instance, because uh, the science says it's, it's more than safe. So there's, there are regulations on canola seed and other products, and it's all about health and phyto and uh, phytosanitary reasons. And uh, they can be a technical barrier to trade, but uh, they are coming down. Uh, probiotics, so it's going to require a lot of research, yeah, uh, can make the same health claims in different countries. That's exactly right. Not only um, the health claims, but um, the, the, the product itself and what it is made of. There's labeling issues there. Um, and if you haven't already, Chelsea, there is a uh, an excellent resource in, in Saskatoon and in Saskatchewan through the, um, uh, through the Food Center, uh, through POS, and a number of other uh, like-minded uh, agencies and facilities that will help you through that very specific scientific question as well. Okay, all right, I'll just wait a, a couple moments to see if there's any other questions. Okay, Chelsea has none. Wendy, you're good. Fantastic, Diane, Dalton, all good. Well, fantastic. Um, thanks very much. Uh, I think it went relatively well for my first presentation via webinar. Um, again, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to contact us. The, I left the contact slide up. Um, we have offices in both Saskatoon and Regina, we're on Hamilton Street, Regina, and right downtown here in Saskatoon. Uh, you can uh, check us out online, but I'm going to give you my personal number um, in case any of you want to talk to me about anything that we might have um, presented or answered here today. It's 306, and I'll give you my Regina number, 306-787-1550. Feel free to call me anytime about any question. Uh, and uh, until we hear from you next, have a great day, have a great week, have a great year, and hopefully we'll see you as an export uh, at a seminar near us fairly soon. Thanks, everybody.
Thanks very much, Chris. That was a wonderful webinar. Um, we really appreciate you giving us the time to share your insight. Um, actually, Chris, I'll continue to turn your mic off. If you turn your mic off. Thank you so much. Sorry, just echoes in the background. You won't be able to hear me. But again, thank you so much. It was a fantastic webinar. So much information to take back. And you provided us with some really great examples. Um, definitely very important to look at your export readiness of your organization, make sure that you are prepared for the boom that hopefully you'll receive um, by going international. And your information about NAFTA, that was really great to hear as well. So um, I also want to thank everyone else for attending the webinar with us today. And just a heads up that our next webinar is Tax Deductible Business Expenses, and that's on November 22nd from 12 to 1. And our presenter is Natalie Stiles. She's a CPA and CGA and owner, owner of Stiles Accounting and Tax Services. So please check your Wesk emails or visit our website to register for that one. Thanks and have a good afternoon, everyone.